Hebrews chapter 4. We, uh, we start Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, the, the writer, the author of Hebrews has been talking about how the history of Israel and the events that happened, some of them anyway, that happened to the nation of Israel are representative of of things that happen in our lives. We talked about this last week. I actually showed you some things up on the, uh, on the, on the big screen. I showed you how, you know, the, their slavery in Egypt is a picture. Their liberation from that slavery is a picture. Their time with the Lord in the wilderness is a picture. Uh, their coming to the promised land is a picture, and so on and so on. And so the author of Hebrews is, he likes to use pictures. Because those pictures help you and I to understand things that are true about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, he's got another picture for us that he's going to be talking about. In fact, he's already started talking about it in the previous chapter. And he's going to continue on now here in chapter 4, where he says, Therefore, verse 1, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today when a long time later he spoke through david as was said before today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if joshua had given them rest god would not have spoken later about another day there remains then a sabbath rest for the people of god for anyone who enters god's rest also rests from his own work just as god did from his let's pray Jesus, fill us with your understanding because this is tough stuff apart from your spirit, Lord. Uh, Just really tune our ears, our spiritual ears to hear your voice, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There are in the latter part of chapter 3 and then in the section that we just read here in chapter 4, no fewer than 11 references to the word rest. And that is the new picture that the author of Hebrews wants to convey to you and I today uh, that is very important, people, very important about our relationship with Christ. And again, this is something that happened to Israel. And here's how it happened to them. Let's just remind ourselves of the context of his statement. When the nation of Israel came to the border of the promised land and God said, this is the land that I have given you. You haven't had a land. In fact, you haven't even been a nation. You remember when they went to Egypt, they were nothing more than just a good-sized family. There was about 70 of them. And while they were there for 400 years, they grew to somewhere around 2.5 to 3 million people. Well, these 2.5 million people, they're living in Egypt, didn't have a country of their own. They had no nation to call their own. God said to them, yeah, but I promised a nation to your forefather Abraham. I reiterated that promise to his son Isaac. I gave that promise again to his son Jacob, who I later named Israel. And now I'm going to make good on that promise. I am going to bring you into the land that I swore to give your forefathers and that, my children, will be your rest. You're not going to wander anymore like a bunch of, you know, herdsmen going from one place to the next place, living in tents. I'm going to bring you to a place that you can call home. And there, my people, I'm going to give you rest. Okay? That's what rest means from the context of what God was doing for Israel. Now, there's a spiritual counterpart to that rest for you and I. God hasn't given you and I a nation. You know, the, you know 
Sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. He never promised to any of us, I'm going to give you this plot of land, and this is going to be yours. He gives us a different kind of rest. And the rest that you and I receive is a rest from our labors. A rest, in, a resting perhaps I should say, in the fact that Jesus Christ has done all the work for salvation and for life. Okay? And what you and I now are called to do, you ready? Is to rest in Him. To rest in Him. But did you notice he introduced even another example related to this whole issue of rest? And that example is, uh, look with me in verse 4. It says, For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Okay? Well, of course, that was in Genesis. So he's bringing, well, what is the seventh day? Seventh day is the Sabbath day, right? It is the day of rest. So he's got two pictures here that he's showing us in the Scripture from the Old Testament that signify or symbolize rest. The first is coming to the border of the promised land. In fact, the land itself. That is your rest, he says to his people. Secondly, it's the Sabbath day, which is a day of rest. Now, he's setting up these two examples to further make his point. And by the way, there are some people who believe today that the Sabbath is still mandatory as a thing that we're supposed to keep as in the body of Christ, you know. Just as Israel was called to rest on the seventh day Sabbath, which is Saturday, you and I are also called to rest on the seventh day Sabbath. You know, what's interesting about that is that it misses the point. It misses the point of what all these examples in the Old Testament are all about. And it misses, most importantly, the point that Jesus fulfills all of the ceremonies and all of the pointers of the feasts and so forth in the Old Testament for you and I. He fulfills them. And in Christ, you know, we basically keep these things. So, you know... What are we going to think about this? Well, you know, look at verse 9 again. Somebody might read verse 9 and say, you know what, this proves we're supposed to still keep the Sabbath. Look at verse 9. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You see, it says it right there. There remains a Sabbath rest. We're still supposed to be having our Sabbath rest. It remains for the people of God. But that's not what it says. You know, there's, a, there's one verse that he, 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 a statement that he made in a previous verse that it's so easy to forget and so easy just to pass along if we don't see it. And I want to put it up on the screen here for you. It's, it's, it's a scripture uh, from verse 3. Look at this, chapter 4, verse 3. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Would you read that aloud with me, please? Let's do it together. Ready? Now we who have believed enter that rest. He's been talking about the rest of God. He's been using the examples of the Old Testament rest of the land, the land I'm giving you. You will be, you will rest in that land. And he's been giving them the example of the Sabbath, the day of rest, one day a week, laying all these things out. Now, now what does he say about all those things? Here's what he says. We who have believed enter the rest of God. Guys, this is so important. Don't miss it. It answers questions about the Sabbath day, but it answers questions about everything else too in our lives. You see, working and resting are pictures of the way a lot of people treat going to heaven. Okay? Some people are working to get to heaven. And when you ask them about whether they're going to heaven, they'll say things like, I hope so. I hope I've lived a good enough life. I hope God accepts me. I hope I've done a good job. You know what that person is doing? They're working. They're working. Because it's kind of a hope so sort of a situation. I hope I'm doing good enough. Right? Now, there's other people who you ask, are you going to heaven? They go, yep, absolutely, 100%. I know that I'm going to heaven. Well, how do you know that? 
because I'm resting. Not in what I can do, but in what Jesus has already done for me on the cross. Oh, well, what did Jesus do for you? He died for my sins. You see? And it's Jesus, remember, plus nothing. Don't forget the reason the author is writing this letter in the first place is because he is a Jew and his own people, the Jews, were turning away from that simple message of Christ and Christ alone. And they were beginning to add other things to it from the law. Jesus plus Sabbath keeping. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus keeping the old food laws. Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus. Have we done that today? Oh yeah, sure. Absolutely. Christians still are tempted to do that today. And it spills over. That attitude of Jesus plus spills over into our daily lives. And then we go through this economic upheaval that we have in our nation and we start seeing our 401k, if you even have one of those, starting to you know, you know, dwindle away. And, 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 we're, and guess what? Now it's Jesus plus. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but, but I got to add something on top of that because otherwise I'm going down the tubes. You see, we weren't, we've, we've slipped ever so subtly away from Jesus Christ and Him only for salvation and for everything else that we've begun to add other things into our walk with Jesus Christ. I got problems in my life. I got issues in my family. I've got issues in my marriage. I've got issues in my business. I've got issues in my finances. Well, let me ask you something. Is Jesus big enough to handle those issues? Good grief. You trusted Him with your salvation. You trusted Him with your eternal destiny. And he can't handle those things? Good grief. What kind of a picture of God do you have? Is he sitting up in heaven wringing his hands? I don't know what I'm going to do now that Wall Street's having trouble. (laughs) Or is he the God, you know, who is sovereign and all powerful, who can work in our lives and give you rest? And listen, it always starts with salvation. And then, when we're truly resting in our salvation, it spills over into the rest of our lives. But the same is true. If we're not fully resting in our salvation, and we're thinking, well, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I went down you know, the aisle one day when I was 10 years old, summer camp, never forget, you know, I went to church camp, praise the Lord. I went down and I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and you know, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and all that kind of good stuff, and now I'm saved, and my sins are forgiven, and I'm going to heaven, and, and I'm trying my best to be a good person. Ooh, did you see that? Just boom, just slipped right in there. That trying to be a good person part. Where does that come from? It comes from working not resting. There's going to be a whole lot of people in heaven one day who got there not because of anything they did, but just because of what Jesus did and because they were willing to rest in what He did and not what they can or can't do. Oh, but Pastor Paul, you don't understand. You don't know the kind of a life I've lived. So? It's not about you. It's about Him. And it's about what He's done. Question is today, are you resting? Okay, so let's go back to the... You see, here's the problem. I could, I, I, you, know, you can ask people, you can say, are you trusting God for the economic upheaval that, that our nation is going through right now and you're not, are you not panicking and are you just resting in God? And somebody might say, well, you know, I don't know. I'm trying. That's usually a reflection of the, 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 the sort of a trip they got going with God related to their salvation too. But it's so subtle, we would never say so. We would never say, oh, I'm not, you know, I, I'm always just trusting in Jesus alone for my salvation. We say that because we know it's theologically correct. But inside, we got this works thing going on. And we're trying to be good people. We're trying to impress God. We're trying to earn His favor. And then when our, things happen in our home and family and marriage, boy, let me tell you something. You want to find out what's really going on in a person's heart, just talk to them the day after they lose their job. And what they're thinking inside their heads. Or, or, or talk to somebody when uh, they just receive a pretty serious diagnosis for them or a family member. Or, or, and, it's, and guys, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm here, I, I understand the temptation to be filled with fear and to run off half-cocked and try to work it out in our own strength and ability. 
But God is calling you and I to a place of rest. It starts at salvation. That's what the author of Hebrews, that's the point he's making. But it, listen guys, it carries on. And, and, and if, it's, if it's firmly founded in our salvation understanding that I'm resting in Jesus Christ, there's nothing I can do, you know? There's nothing I can do, you know? That's it! There's nothing I can do about being saved. All I've done is just receive, you know? The only thing I brought into the salvation equation was the sin that I had to be forgiven from. That's the only thing I, you know, offered. That's the only thing I contributed <laughs> was my sin. That's it. I am holy, 100% dependent on Him to be saved. Wow. Wow. Guess what, guys? That spills over. That spills over into our lives. Now, we who have believed enter that rest. Now, there is another statement that he made in the previous chapter and it's in chapter 3 verse 19 do we have that one here next yeah this was the last verse of the previous chapter in making the statement about the fact that the nation of israel couldn't go in to the promised land he said this so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief okay they couldn't enter into the rest of God because of their unbelief. Let me ask you a question. What keeps you and I from resting in God? Well, this isn't rocket science here, guys. It's unbelief. That's what it is. That's what keeps you and I from entering in and having restful hearts. Hey, the world can be sinking into the quicksand all around you and God can give you and I a peace. A peace that passes understanding. It's a rest that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt God's in charge here. He's in charge of my life. You know why? I gave Him that, or I gave him that freedom. He, first of all, he, he bought and paid for me with His blood. And secondly, I've just given over my life to Him and I said, Jesus, I have screwed things up in my life so bad. I need You to help me in my life. I need you to be the Lord of my life. I invite you to be the Lord. You know, I've made you my Savior. Now I'm making you Lord. And I'm just giving you that freedom to be the Lord of my life. Do you think He's going to let you fall? you think He's going to let you die? Do you think you can't really trust Him with your life? That's a good question to ask ourselves. Because why are we getting all hot and bothered and worried and upset and frustrated and stressed out? Many times it's because of unbelief. We talked about this last week, but it's a major issue. We have to remember. In fact, put the other passage now below this one so we can see these two together. So here's the top thing. We see that they, the nation of Israel, they were not able to enter into the rest of God. Why? Because of their unbelief. But we who have believed... We who have faith in God, who trust in God, what have we done? We have entered that rest. We take hold of that rest. And guys, that refers to the Sabbath too. If anybody comes along and says, do you keep the Sabbath? You tell them, you bet I do. Every day of the week. How do you know? Because I have faith in Jesus. Right? Because I have faith in Him. And because I know that we who have believed enter into the rest of God. Listen, the Sabbath was just a pointer. It says it in Colossians. We're not going to turn there, but if you want to see it for yourself, uh, you know, make a little note of Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And it says in there, don't let anybody judge you by what you eat or drink or, or this or that or a Sabbath day. Paul goes on to say in Colossians 2, these are just a shadow of things to come. Christ is the reality. Okay? So, are you resting today? Are you resting today in Jesus? You know, the, 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 the final kicker for this study is, is uh, and, uh, verse 10. Um, actually, that's a typo in the bottom. It should be Hebrews 4.10. 
But it's this. This is, this is chapter 4, verse 10. It says, For anyone who enters God's rest, okay, and we know how we do that. We enter it by faith, right? Also rests from his own work just as God did from his. You want to know where burnout and stress and all those other rotten things come from? It comes from working and not resting and not trusting God with your life. And I know that there are people here in this room today. I know you got issues. I know you do. And I know that because I got issues. And the only way we're going to make it through, and the only way we're really going to have any peace and joy in our lives is if we bring those things to the cross and we say, you know what? I'm done. I am done. Working and striving and stressing. And you know, maybe I need to come back to just the, the, the point of salvation. Not that I need to get saved again, but I need to come back to the cross and I need to say, you know what? My salvation is based on you and you alone. Why shouldn't everything else be too? You know, I came to you when I had nothing in my hands and you filled them full of you. I came to you and all I had was sin and you forgave me and you washed all my sin away and now I'm going to heaven. Nothing of myself, all of you. I know I'm going to heaven. Now, I take this thing, my family, my marriage, my unsaved loved ones, our financial train wreck, my thoughts, my kids, and I give these things to you. And I'm going to put them in your hands, God. And I'm going to start learning what it means to rest and to trust you with the outcome. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up here and we're going to take just a minute here this morning and we are going to respond to the Holy Spirit because it's just too easy, you know, for us to hear the Word of God, to go through a study like this in, in Hebrews 4 and then say, okay, amen. Well, when's the game start? You know, or what's for lunch? Or something like that. It's just, it's way too easy, isn't it? But let's, let's pause for just a moment here and let's take a minute and let's just determine in our hearts that we're going to say yes to Jesus. So let's just pray together as we worship. Do you know what we're doing this morning? We're exalting the Lord. And that's what we need to do over all the areas of our life. We need to exalt Him. Put Him above them. Above your problems, above your issues, starting with salvation and moving on outward into all areas of our life. Let's pray. Father, we just exalt you right now. Lord, it starts with the fact that I realize there's no possible way I could be forgiven of all my sin. There's just there's no goodness in me. And the only thing I can do is trust in you and rest that what you did on the cross when you died for me was enough. And I choose to do that today. Again, afresh. No holes barred. No Jesus plus anything. Just Jesus. He is my Lord. My Master. My Savior. And Lord, now from the foundation of Jesus only for my salvation... We spread that out into other areas of our lives. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ for our marriages and homes and families. God, we pray for our children who've gone wayward. They're just, some of them are just running and we don't, and we're scared. Lord, we've got wives and husbands who no longer want to be married because they've been filled with such hopelessness and such bitterness and they just can't let go. Father, we've got financial outlooks that just don't look real rosy. We've got business situations. We don't know what's going to happen. We exalt you, Lord God, over all those things right now in the name of Jesus. We exalt you above them all. Now, Lord God, would you, would you give us your rest as we say, Lord, I trust you with the outcome of this thing. I trust you, Lord God, for my marriage. I trust you for my business. I trust you for my, my life, my health. 
I trust You, God. I put these things in Your hands. And I trust You with the outcome. Be the Lord of my life. And give me the strength every day, God, to trust You more. Oh, Jesus, we worship You. We bless You. Hallelujah. Jesus, we're going to get serious about trusting You from this day forward because we pray these things in Your powerful name. And all God's people said, Amen.